time to kill your comrades, bestie. And it's time to kill your besties, comrade. Stras my washers and dryers, welcome back to Thick Nonfic. We continue through Simon Sebag Montefiore's Stalin biography. In today's episode, we are focusing on the terror period from 1932 to 1939, in which Stalin tested the resolve and loyalty of his inner circle. Let's meet our contestants. Genrik Yagoda, NKVD chief. Nikolai Dyezhov also an NKVD operative. He's also referred to as Stalin's Black Bear. You'll see that nickname come up frequently. Nestor Lakoba, who is Beria's mentor. Lavrenti Beria, whom we've met before, an NKVD operative and just all around terrible person. Vyacheslav Molotov, who was premier and foreign minister. Georgi Malenkov, who was CC secretary. And Grigory Orjonikidze, who was Sergo, because his name is a mouthful more so than the others. He was also the heavy industry chief. The terror could arguably have been kicked off with the whole Kulak situation, uh, but there's also an argument to be made that the terror really kicked off with the assassination of Kirov. As mentioned, he died under mysterious circumstances at the end of part two, and we're gonna go back, paint that picture a little more clearly, and deal with some of the fallout of what happened after his assassination. So let's paint a picture of what happened the night Kirov died. Kirov was just walking, he turned a corner into a stairwell, and he passed by Leonid Nikolaev. Leonid Nikolaev like pressed himself against the wall to let Kirov pass, and then Nikolaev continued to follow him. Nikolaev pulled out a Nagan revolver, and he shot Kirov through the back of the neck. Uh, it passed through the skull cap. Nikolaev turned the pistol on himself, but an electrician was working nearby, heard the gunfire, and deflected the bullet, so the second bullet just flew into the ceiling. And Seabag Montefiore paints a picture of Nikolaev through this fallout, saying that Nikolaev was one of those tragic, simple victims of history. Uh, he had been kicked out of the party and reinstated, and he had written to both Kirov and Stalin like, hey, help me out. And so they're like, hey, we have a little mission for you. We got this little thing for you to do. When he gets arrested, understandably, he throws himself at Stalin's feet, begging, like, what did I do? And Stalin orders for him to be taken away. The well-informed NKVD defector Orlov wrote that Nikolaev pointed at Shaporozhets, Leningrad's deputy NKVD boss, and said, why are you asking me? Ask him. So there's a conspiracy afoot there. Sivag Montefiore goes on to say that there, in a man who killed his best friends, was true friendship. Whether or not he killed Kirov, Stalin certainly exploited the murder to destroy not only his opponents, but the less radical among his own allies. And that is the key to the terror. Because, like, he's going to kill a ton of Russians. And we're going to see a ton of Russians die in World War II. The terror ran from the bottom to the top. And this was the system that would carry us to World War II. Yuri Zhdanov, who was a general in the Red Army, pointed out that everything changed after Kirov's death. The atmosphere of Stalin's court, which up until then had been very informal, almost kind of fun, went away. Security was amped up to ridiculous proportions, and the atmosphere that Zhdanov was referring to, you know, a very fun, lively atmosphere, he's like, that really could have helped after Kirov's death. But no fun suckers. <laughs> Stalin's paranoia really started to come into play here. He was walking along with an officer pointing out to people as they were walking by, saying, do you notice how they are? You're walking down the corridor and thinking, which one will it be? If it's this one, he'll shoot you in the back after you've turned. If it's this one, he'll shoot you in the face. So we get into some other chapters that kind of just deal with Stalin, but when we get back into the, the terror-focused things, we are briefly introduced to Valerian Kubishev, who at the age of 47 died unexpectedly of heart disease and alcoholism, just eight weeks after his friend Kirov. It had been claimed that he was murdered by his doctors, an impression not necessarily confirmed by his inclusion in the list of those supposedly poisoned by Yagoda. With Kubishev's death, it was very much like an, oh, he was definitely murdered by his doctors, that's a conspiracy. But Kubishev's son was like, ah. I mean, my dad was a raging alcoholic, so it's not unsurprising that he would drop dead at 47 of alcoholism, you know? But this is the atmosphere that we're dealing with now. Uh, all deaths of prominent people are suspect. So another aspect of the fallout of Kirov's death is that Kirov left a gaping hole in his position in the Central Committee, so someone else needs to fill that position. And Lazar Kriganovich nominated his protege, who would be Nikolai Yezhov, to fill that position. So hey, he gets promoted, except... <laughs> Oh no, you have a giant target on your back now. Getting promoted is not a great thing. And Yezhov was a very nervous person. Uh, Seabag Montefiore describes him as unstable, sexually confused, and highly strung. He was too weak to compete with bulldozers like Kaganovich, not to mention Stalin himself. 
Yezhov suffered constant nervous illnesses, including sores and itchy skin, TB, angina, sciatica, psoriasis, and what they call neurasthenia. He often sank into gloomy depression, drank too much, and had to be nurtured by Stalin just to get to work. So Stalin likes him, which is good, uh, or it's bad. And Yezhov gets to find out which is which. We get into some of the politics of some of the terror. And it says Stalin issued a secret circular on July 29th, which announced that a terrorist leviathan named the United Trotskyite Zinovievite Center had attempted to assassinate Stalin, Voroshilov, Kiganovich, Kirov, Sergo, Zhdanov, and others. These lists of purported targets became a bizarre honor since inclusion signified proximity to Stalin. So later there were like teams formed within the Politburo to deal with things. And at one point, Molotov was not included on one of these teams. And it was interpreted as a sign of opposition to the terror, but it seems he was temporarily out of favor. Stalin and Molotov went way back. And so Molotov had a better f like sense of self to stand up to Stalin. And sometimes that manifested in Molotov being pushed around within the Politburo and not assigned to certain things. So we get into part four, Slaughter, Yezhov the Poison Dwarf. This book came out a long time ago. There's some outdated terms just as a heads up if you decide to read it. So the first chapter in this section is The Executioner, Beria's Poison and Bukharin's Dosage. And it says Stalin never attended a torture or execution. It's possible he would have seen some hangings growing up, but he respected his executioners. And when Yezhov was appointed, like he was in the previous part, some people were relieved because they're like, there's no way Stalin would have appointed this basket case to deal with this very serious thing. Maybe it's the end of the terror. And it's like, no, sweetie, this is the start of it. <laughs> Kikanovich knew what he was doing, putting his protege in that position. He knew what Yezhov would bring to the NKVD. And it was a metric butt ton of poison. He poisoned people all the time. We experience along in this chapter, uh, the death of Lakoba. Nestor Lakoba, who is Beria's mentor, winds up dead. <laughs> They're like, let's do an autopsy, and Beria's like, oops, his organs gone. Beria exhumed the body of his mentor and had it destroyed. And Lakoba's family also killed. Oopsie doopsie. To cover his tracks, Beria's like, congratulations, I just killed an enemy of the people. And that's that's the steps. If you ever want to kill your enemies, kill them discreetly, destroy the body, declare them an enemy of the state. Works like a charm. The next chapter, Sergo, Death of the Perfect Bolshevik. Spoiler alert for things that happened 84 years ago. Sergo was starting to get sick and he was starting to feel very nervous because he could feel the doors closing and he could feel himself scrambling to maintain favor with Stalin and he faced a rupture with the party to which he had devoted his life. And he says, I don't understand why Stalin doesn't trust me. I'm completely loyal to him. I don't want to fight with him. Beria's schemes play a large part in this. He gives Stalin the wrong information, but Stalin trusts him. And so despite all the work that Sergo did for the party, he's out of luck and he's out of time. And his apartment gets broken into by the NKVD and searched. And he comes to Stalin and he's like, why, why would you do this? Why would you have the party come and search my apartment? And Stalin, he's like, Sergo, why are you upset? This organ can search my place at any moment too. Sergo would be dead by the end of this chapter. So the next chapter is the massacre of generals, fall of Yagoda, and death of a mother. Uh, Stalin's mother would pass away during this time, uh, and Yezhov would pass away. No, he would foil an assassination attempt. He discovered that Yagoda had tried to poison him by spraying mercury onto his curtains. And it was a fake, Yezhov was totally lying, but Yagoda was arrested at his Kremlin apartment, and even before the Politburo had formally given the order. So Yagoda's out of the way, and Yezhov cleared his place. And that is how you keep your position. You kick out any guy who would ever try to claim your position. <laughs> so I, I do want to reiterate, the terror was not the terror just because Stalin's friends were like playing sick pranks on each other, you know, like the, the poison curtains prank or the killing my godfather prank. The, the, it wasn't that. It was still terrorizing millions of people, arresting them randomly, killing them even more so. So this chapter, Bloodbath by Numbers, we get in to see who's being productive. <laughs> they did not specify the names, but simply assigned quotas of deaths by the thousands. On the 2nd of July, 1937, the Politburo ordered local secretaries to arrest and shoot the most hostile anti-Soviet elements were to be sentenced by Troikas. And Troikas were three-man tribunals that included the local party secretary, the procurator, and the NKVD chief. And Yezhov was like, better too far than not far enough. His arrest quota 
ballooned to 767,397 arrests and 386,798 executions. Again, Stalin isn't the only guy involved in this. He's definitely the mastermind, as Simon C. Montefiore puts it, but this whole systematic murder thing, he points out, started with Lenin, and this social system based on bloodletting justified murder now happiness later. Man, people got their hands dirty. I didn't write down the page number, but it said that sometimes Beria liked to do the murders himself. You know, he wasn't going to outsource that. He was going to go above and beyond. It wasn't just like enemies of the state. It extended to their families. Uh, they had to be isolated, explained Molotov. Otherwise, they'd have spread all kinds of complaints. So on the 5th of July, 1937, three days later, the Politburo ordered the NKVD to confine all wives of condemned traitors in camps for five to eight years and to take under state protection children under 15. But this wasn't enough. On the 15th of August, Yezhov decreed that children between one and three were to be confined in orphanages, but socially dangerous children between 3 and 15 could be imprisoned depending on the degree of danger. Four-year-olds can't trust them. Put them in prison. So Yezhov was constantly working. It says that Stalin received Yezhov 1,100 times during the terror, second only to Molotov in frequency. Yezhov would work in this system, and Yezhov was a freak. Like, he would have orgies to unwind. Soviet Russia was weirdly prudish. Like, Stalin had a whole movie pulled because he's like, that kiss is too sensual. Get it out. There would be people who would be arrested and put to death because they were too kinky in the eyes of the state. And Seabag Montevideo points out, debauchery was never the real reason victims were destroyed. This was always political. The accusations of sexual deviance were deployed to dehumanize them among their former colleagues. It's like reverse justification. It's like, well, why was this person killed? And it's like, well, they were a freak. Freak in the sheets. We had to kill them. That keeps going. People who are just minding their own business, who weren't enemies of the state, who weren't politically affiliated with everything, but maybe were married to someone in the Politburo, would be killed and it'd be like, she was a slut. So we had these quotas, and everyone wants to be an overachiever, which, great, except the regions were soon killing too many too quickly. Khrushchev, Moscow leader, effectively ordered the shooting of 55,741 officials, which more than fulfilled the original Politburo quota of 50,000. And so Khrushchev wrote to Stalin and he's like, hey comrade, can I kill an extra 2,000 kulaks? I'm like, I'm running out of people to kill. A very good picture that Simon paints during this section is how this affected people who could see what was happening but weren't told what that was. And we have a dinner where Svetlana's best friend Martha was present. And she said, dinner was miserable for me, but she wasn't afraid of Stalin because she'd known him since childhood. Yet nothing was quite what it seemed for these children. So many of Svetlana's parents' friends disappeared. Martha had just seen her mother's new lover arrested. So if you're a kid, you're walking around and your neighbors are gone. Your parents are gone, and you have no idea why. You just know they're an enemy of the state. A very good book that addresses this is actually Breaking Stalin's Nose. It was written by a kid who grew up in the Soviet Union, and it goes through kind of that paranoia of, you may live in this apartment, but your neighbor at the end of the hallway has a much nicer apartment. It'd be a shame if someone were to call the NKVD on them, and their apartment would be vacated for you. So we get into part five, slaughter. Beria arrives, and this is 1938 to 1939. And during this section, uh, in the early February of 1938, a drunken Blackberry led an expedition to purge Kiev, where aided by the new Ukrainian viceroy Khrushchev, another 30,000 were arrested. And they arrived to find out that virtually the whole Ukrainian Politburo had been purged under his predecessor Kosyor. Khrushchev kept arresting people, going way over his quota. I didn't mention Khrushchev at the beginning, but that's honestly a great demonstration of who he was as a person. He slipped through the cracks and was just as devastating as the rest of them. We get into a chapter, Beria and the Weariness of Hangmen, and it gets into, I believe this is the section where it talks about how Beria just loved to do it himself. He loved getting his own hands dirty. Like, we'll get into it more in Death of Stalin, spoilers for things that happened 70 years ago. Beria had a certain quality that was just monstrous, and it was an extreme abuse of power. 
and taking advantage of the fact that he could do whatever he wanted because no one was going to stop him. And so he was very shrewd and he saw the opportunities that would await him if he were head of the NKVD and he took advantage of that. And that's what we're gonna see in this chapter. So a very key aspect to Beria swooping in to take over the NKVD is the fact that Yezhov drank all the time. And Yezhov could sense that Stalin was getting more and more displeased with the way things were going. And that made him feel even worse, so he drank even more. And it says he made frantic attempts to prove his worth. And instead, Yezhov was called upon to kill his own NKVD appointees whom he had protected. So it's like, you want, you want to be in charge? Prove it. And Beria waged a quiet campaign to destroy Blackberry. He invited Khrushchev for dinner where he warned him about Malenkov's closeness with Yezhov. Khrushchev realized that Beria was really warning him about his own friendship with Yezhov. No doubt Beria had had the same conversation with Malenkov. And he continued to isolate Yezhov, which would deteriorate Yezhov further, and eventually lead to Yezhov messing up. On 29th of September, Yezhov lost much of his power when Beria was appointed to run the heart of the NKVD, State Security, or the GUGB. Now, he co-signed Yezhov's orders. So Yezhov, what little control he had, Beria gets to co-sign. The next chapter is the tragedy and depravity of the Yezhovs, because like Yezhov was a freak, but so was his wife, and they would, they would do their little orgies together. And regional NKVD bosses, they started to get tired of Yezhov's antics, and they started to denounce him as well. The Yezhovs would be arrested and put to death, both of them. And we get to Death of the Stalin Family, a strange proposal, and the housekeeper. And the chapter opens, with letting Beria into the family was like locking a fox in a chicken coop. And this was precisely why Stalin had promoted him. No one was sacred. And so I don't know if it was like out of fear, out of kind of this bartering system of like, I've promoted you, please cooperate, or if there's something else going on. And Svetlana's circle of influence or circle of support continued to diminish uh, with the dismissal and arrest of the housekeeper Carolina Till, who was German, and Germans were part of that purge in Russia. And that was like her last link to her mom. And Beria, out of the goodness of his heart, found a replacement in his niece of his wife Nina from Georgia. And those ever, his motives remain unclear. With all of this going on, with all the changes happening in Stalin's own household, he was very careful that there shouldn't be any gossip about him. He understood the danger of gossip. If other men could be betrayed by their wives, he was safe at that point. So part of the fallout of the arrest and eventual death of the Yezhovs was they looked through his apartment and stuff is to be expected. Bottles of vodka, empty, half empty and full. But then they also found 115 counter-revolutionary books, guns. But most interestingly is Yezhov collected materials about Stalin's pre-1917 police records. And there is also information against Molotov. Those papers disappeared into Beria's safe. So who's still around? Well, we still have Molotov, we still have Beria, we still have Malenkov. Uh, but the, the circle's shrinking. So that wraps up the section on the terror. So many people died. I want to reiterate that Stalin, through his movement for political repression, through Yezhov's vicious campaign of poisoning people, Beria getting his hands dirty and killing people, Khrushchev going above and beyond to bust his quotas wide open and kill people. Historians estimate between 950,000 people and 1.2 million people were killed for political reasons. And I described the terror at the beginning of being between 1932 and 1939, because I'm including the like psychological terror required to get people to do these horrific things in the name of the party, in the name of Stalin, in the name of the Soviet Union. It was just two years, if that. Some people say it's just the year of 37, it's just ethnic cleansing, purging the party. The only thing that stopped it really was World War II, which we'll get into next. Wow, what a bummer to end this one on. <laughs> but geez, what, what can you say? I want to maintain a somewhat lighthearted approach to this, but I do want to still convey it was messed up. It was, it was horrible. Um, the book is still endlessly fascinating, and this, the stuff about World War II is also fascinating. Regrettably, I hate that the World War II stuff is still really fascinating because it's such a cliche to be into World War II history. But I, I hope you at least enjoyed the intrigue. So yeah, let me know what you thought. 
we'll, we'll have World War II, and I may go ahead and tack on the post-World War II stuff if, if that ends up being short. I didn't take a ton of notes on the World War II stuff because I don't see this book as a World War II book, and it's just focusing on the Russia stuff, so we'll just kind of briskly walk through World War II, and then we'll deal with the fallout after that, and then we'll be done. I It's currently 7.25 when I'm filming this. I have like 250 pages left to read, so I have about a week to finish and that seems doable. Thank you so much for watching. Uh, make sure you go to the bank to get quarters for the laundromat because you don't want to be caught out. I don't know if laundromats even let you use cards, so yeah, make sure you have quarters in your car for that. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed. Have a lovely, lovely evening, and I will see you all next time.